The early years of heavier-than-air aviation included famous inventors such as Wilbur and Orville Wright from Dayton, Ohio, Glenn Curtis from Hammondsport, New York, Brazilian-born Alberto Santos Dumont, and Louis Blerio from France. Although they differed in their origins, temperaments, and design strategies, all of them were male and all of them were white. In 1892, however, a tiny baby was born in northeastern Texas who eventually would change the face of aviation, both figuratively and literally. On January 26th of that year, Elizabeth Bessie Coleman was born in Atlanta, Texas. Her parents, George and Susan Coleman, were African-American sharecroppers who could neither read nor write. In 1894, the Coleman family moved to Waxahachie, Texas, a town about 30 miles south of Dallas. At age six, Bessie started attending school in a one-room shack, four miles from her home. In 1901, tired of the racism that faced black people in Texas, George Coleman, being part Choctaw, decided to move to Oklahoma, then called Indian Territory. Susan Coleman, however, insisted on staying in Texas with her daughters. Susan began working for a white family. When cotton harvest came around, mother and daughters augmented the family's meager income by picking cotton. In 1910, Bessie enrolled in the Agricultural and Normal University, a blacks-only school in Langston, Oklahoma. Poverty forced her to leave after just one year, so she returned home and earned money by washing clothes. When Bessie turned 23, she moved to Chicago to live with two older brothers, Walter and John. Walter worked regularly as a Pullman porter, but John was often unemployed. While still living down in Texas, Coleman had announced to her mother that she wanted, quote, to amount to something, unquote. Now, up in Chicago, she sought a better life than that of just a maid, cook, or laundress. She attended the Burnham School of Beauty Culture and then found a job as a manicurist in a men's barber shop on Chicago's south side. In 1917, when the United States entered World War I, Coleman's brothers went to Europe as part of Illinois' all-black 8th Army National Guard. After the war ended, the brothers returned home, and one brother started teasing Bessie about her limited circumstances, saying that French women had much better career prospects. Some French women, he added, even took to the skies as pilots. Coleman took her brother's remark as a provocation to learn to fly, but she quickly discovered that no American aviation school would train women or minorities. Undeterred by the limits placed on her sex and race, she developed a plan to make it to France and learn to fly. She took French lessons, found a better-paying job, and enlisted the aid of African Americans to bring her plan to fruition. One person who helped Coleman financially was Robert Abbott, founder and owner of the Chicago Defender, one of the city's leading black newspapers. She also sought help from Jesse Binga, an ambitious real estate owner and founder of a bank that bore his name. In 1920, claiming to be four years younger than her actual age of 28, Coleman applied for an American passport. On November 20th of that year, she boarded the SS Imparator in New York Harbor and steamed for Europe. In northern France, Coleman found training at the Caudron Brothers Aviation School. Founded by the French airplane builders René Caudron and his brother Gaston, the aviation school was at the time the most famous one in France. Coleman's training plane was the Newport Type 82, a common trainer of the era. During her seventh-month course, she learned how to make banking turns, how to recover from tailspins, and how to loop the loop. With a pilot's license dated June 15, 1921, Bessie Coleman became the first black person in the world, man or woman, to earn an international pilot's license. After finishing her course in northern France, she went to Paris for additional training. In September, she steamed for home on the SS Manchuria. 
When the ship arrived in New York, newspaper men, both white and black, met the ship in order to meet America's first black woman aviator. While in New York, Coleman was wined and dined by the African-American community. She attended performances of a play called Shuffle Along, the first successful musical in America starring black actors. With lyrics written by pianist Eubie Blake and his friend Noble Sissel, the musical included performers such as Florence Mills and the incomparable Ethel Waters. When Coleman returned to Chicago, the Defender printed a photograph of her mother holding a silver cup that the flyer had received in New York from Shuffle Along cast members. In the 1910s and 20s, American pilots had few ways to make a living. Most commonly, they earned income by holding air shows, performing feats like parachuting, challenging race cars to high-speed dashes, or looping the loop. To succeed on the air show circuit, Coleman quickly realized that she needed more flight training. But American flying schools continued to refuse her admittance. In February of 1922, therefore, Coleman returned to New York City to prepare for a second trip to France. Once again, New York's African-American community entertained the flyer. She met again with cast members of the Shuffle Along musical and addressed the 2,500-member Metropolitan Baptist Church, which gave her a standing ovation. On February 22nd, back she steamed to France, this time on the SS Paris. After two months of flight training in France, Coleman went to Holland, where she met the Dutch airplane designer Anthony Fokker. In late May, she went to Germany, soon borrowed a plane, and flew it over the Kaiser's Palace in Berlin. She stayed ten weeks in that country, meeting many flyers. Among them was Robert Talon, a German aviation pioneer, one of the Wright brothers' European employees, and designer of the Albatross D-3 fighter plane of World War I. In early August, Coleman steamed for home on the SS Nordam. Newsmen once again met her ship when it docked in New York Harbor. Realizing that dramatic stories would entice air shows to hire her as an aerial performer, she claimed that she had learned to fly after serving with the Red Cross in Europe during World War I. She also claimed to have met German royalty and politicians, and that she had flown a large German seaplane. Coleman's chance to fly before the American public first came at Curtis Field in Garden City, Long Island, in early September of 1922. New York's all-black 15th Infantry paraded on the field, and the flyer herself wore a military-style outfit while flying a Curtis JN-4. Upon landing, the flyer received a bouquet of flowers from none other than Trinidad's famed aviation pioneer and a self-promoter in his own right, Hubert Fauntleroy Julian. The September 4th issue of one of New York's papers reported that at least 1,000 spectators, mostly African American, had attended the event. In mid-October, at Checkerboard Field in Chicago, Coleman made her first flights in front of her adopted city. The airport's owner, a white flyer named David Benke, who supported her flying efforts, provided the plane for her performance. In January of 1923, Coleman boarded a train for the West Coast to meet with officers of the Coast Tire and Rubber Company in California in hopes of doing aerial advertising for the firm. After visiting the company's manufacturing plant in Oakland, she headed south to Rockwell Air Intermediate Depot in San Diego, where she acquired a Curtis JN-4. In early February, Coleman took off from Santa Monica to fly 25 miles to a fairground celebration in Los Angeles. At 300 feet, her engine stalled and the plane then crashed. Coleman was knocked unconscious and suffered a broken leg three broken ribs, several cuts, and other injuries. Rescuers took her to St. Catherine Hospital in downtown Santa Monica, where it took her three months to recuperate. It took over two more years for Coleman to return to flying. 
Now performing in Houston, Texas in 1925, she did motor stalls, dives, barrel rolls, figure eights, and loop the loops. Her performance had particular social and cultural importance because it took place on June 19th, or Juneteenth, the date on which Texas slaves first learned of their emancipation through an order read by Union General Gordon Granger. In mid-July, Coleman flew at a church event in Richmond, Texas, and then again in Houston for black employees of the Southern Pacific Railway. In early August, she flew in San Antonio, and in early September, she flew in Wharton, Texas, and performed a parachute jump. Coleman finally made her way to Waxahachie, her childhood town. As was common then, white spectators and black spectators sat in different sections. However, in Waxahachie and other venues over the years, the flyer demanded that both races enter through the same gate or else she would not fly. In January of 1926, Coleman went south again, giving aviation lectures first in Georgia and then in Florida. With a steadier income, she bought another plane, a used Curtis JN-4, stored at Love Field in Dallas to replace the one destroyed in her Santa Monica crash. Coleman now was in Jacksonville, Florida, so she hired a white pilot named William D. Wills to fly the plane to her. She was scheduled to perform again on May 1st at Paxson Field in Jacksonville for members of the city's Negro Welfare League. On April 30th, Wills flew over the field at 3,000 feet with Coleman as a passenger so she could determine the best landing spot for her next day's parachute jump. The plane suddenly sped up, dropped into a tailspin, and then turned over at 500 feet. With her seat belt unbuckled to better see her landing spot, Coleman fell out of the plane and plunged to her death. Wills could not regain control of the plane, hit a tree, and crashed to his death about 300 yards from where Coleman's body lay. Although joined in their fates, Wills and Coleman were segregated after their deaths, as Coleman's body went to a blacks-only funeral home. The black-owned Chicago Defender spread news of Coleman's death across the entire front page of its paper. A white-owned Jacksonville paper posted a small news article in the upper left corner of its front page, giving Wills pride of place in the report. The African-American community gave Coleman a royal send-off worthy of her aviation nickname, Queen Bess. Her body first lay in state at Jacksonville's Bethel Baptist Institutional Church. From there, her body went on to Orlando, Florida, where she was honored at Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church. And in Chicago, on Friday, May 7, 1926, 10,000 mourners paid their respects at Pilgrim Baptist Church. America's first black woman flyer lies buried in Lincoln Cemetery in Blue Island, Illinois. At the time of her death, Elizabeth Bessie Coleman was only 34 years old.